John Dever had a vision for this symposium, and at its heart was the participation of our next speaker. First, I want to thank Larry Dodolo, the President and CEO of the Virginia Tidewater Consortium, for his leadership in arranging uh, this part of the program. In this part, we will have remarks from the podium, followed by a question and answer se session. Please give an enthusiastic welcome to author, philosopher, educator, and motorcycle mechanic, Matthew Crawford. Thanks. I want to uh, thank President Dever, Dean Tompkins, and Larry Dudelow for the invitation to be here. You might be wondering who the heck I am. Um, and in light of Senator Kane's comments, I, I really recognize myself in that kid he was talking about. Um, when I was 17, the only thing that kept me going to school every day was machine shop. I was getting an F in calculus. Um, but, uh, you know, I was making parts for my own car, so that was, uh, and like T Senator Kane said, it's, uh, it was, th you know, through that that I began to see the logic of why education is important in general. It wasn't irrelevant. So I want to talk about uh, building things and fixing things, uh, because I think that kind of work has a wider cultural significance that's worth thinking about. And this is something that I started thinking about maybe 15 years ago when I noticed um, sort of changes in material culture that were making it harder to be self-reliant, just harder literally to get a handle on your own stuff. There's a design philosophy that's emerged where the point seems to be to hide the works. So for example, if you lift the, the hood on some cars now, what you're likely to see is something like this. Essentially, there's another hood under the hood, as though the sight of an alternator might offend us somehow. <laughs> Some high-end cars now don't even have a dipstick, so you couldn't check your own oil level if you wanted to. And I can't be the only person who's a little bit creeped out by that. <laughs> uh, instead, you get an email from someplace telling you your oil level is low. Now, it used to be that in addition to a dipstick, you had something called an idiot light. And it was called an idiot light for a reason, right? We had a harsh judgment of anyone who was so uninvolved with their own car that they let it get to the point that the light is coming on. But there seems to be a weird cultural logic according to which idiocy, that is, a lack of involvement, gets recast as something desirable, right? It's a sign of technological progress. And of course, it is a kind of progress when you no longer have to mess around with dipsticks and dirty rags and all that. <clears throat> but I also want to just notice that there is a kind of moral education that is tacit in technology, and it can go in various directions. The way things are going currently, I think it often feels like the modern personality is being reformed in the direction of passivity and dependence. There are just fewer occasions to be directly responsible for your own physical environment. And with that, I think, comes less expectation of responsibility. If you're over a certain age, and I think uh, many of you are, you probably remember that before there was the internet, there was something called the Sears catalog. <laughs> and it had more or less the same function. And. Uh, Back in the day, the Sears catalog included these blown-up parts diagrams for all the appliances that they sold. And by the way, raise your hand if you know what this is. <laughs> okay, just checking, because I've, I've shown this picture sometimes at uh, liberal arts colleges and, and sort of people sort of look at it like, what is that? <laughs> is it a new app? What is it? Um, now, it was just taken for granted that the consumer would demand this kind of information uh, because they expected to own it for decades and they wanted to know that parts were available and how it all went together. Whereas now, um, let's say your washing machine breaks down. Well, even if you are the kind of person who's comfortable with motors and solenoids and relays and basic stuff like that, you might well feel daunted 
from taking on the repair yourself, uh, not least because of the layers of electronic crap, frankly, that get piled on top of machines, often for no good reason. And besides, time is money, right? You can't learn to do everything. <clears throat> you have to pick your battles. So it might make more sense to just send that washing machine to a landfill and get a new one, even though you know it's probably just some $20 part that's gone bad. Now, you can criticize that decision from the perspective of environmentalism and sustainability. And I think those are important arguments to make. But the argument I want to make is different. It's really about the effects on the individual. Because I think that this kind of learned helplessness leaves us missing something that's really at the core of being human. And that is the experience of individual agency. And by that, I simply mean the experience of seeing a direct effect of your actions in the world and knowing that these actions are genuinely your own. And I want to highlight this idea because I think it's one of the sort of signature features of modern life altogether that we often feel like we're moving in these channels that have been projected from afar by these vast impersonal forces that are very hard to bring into view on a first-person scale, you know, globalization or collateralized debt obligations, whatever it may be. Some of us worry that we're actually becoming stupider and begin to wonder if getting a handle on the world uh, intellectually may actually depend on getting a grasp on it in some literal and active sense. I think that's why tinkering is important. That's why shop class in schools is important. These are ways that a young person begins to make his or her world intelligible. And conversely, if you don't feel that you can have an effect on the world, if you've never had that concrete experience, I think it becomes very attractive to retreat into a virtual world where you're offered a kind of fantasy of agency and competence, right? So in playing video games, you blow stuff up <clears throat> and you get blown up and you just hit reset and there are no real consequences to your actions. Unlike, say, wiring a house, where <laughs> if you get it wrong enough, the house will burn down. So I want to kind of start by talking about work as it appears on TV. It's just kind of a, an easy way into the, the state of the culture. So has anyone here seen um, Deadliest Catch or um, Ice Road Truckers? There's, there's so many of these shows now that, that are about um, people doing hard work. And um, so here, you know, this is uh, Deadliest Catch shows these commercial fishermen in the Bering Sea. And um, here's another shot. So, you know, it's often 30 foot seas. The deck is covered in ice. And that basket on a good day would be full of fish. It weighs like, a t you know, a thousand pounds, something like that. And it's swinging around. And it's the kind of work where if you lose your concentration for even a few seconds, you can die. And in fact, people do die all the time. It's sort of crazily dangerous work. <clears throat> There's another show, Dirty Jobs, that shows all kinds of grueling work. There was one episode that featured a guy who inseminates turkeys for a living. And I think the weird fascination of these shows <laughs> must lie in the fact that they're depicting these confrontations with material reality that have become exotically unfamiliar to us. Many of us do work that feels more surreal than real. <laughs> so when you're working in an office, there's Dwight, um, it's often difficult to see any tangible results from your actions. What exactly have you accomplished at the end of any given day? The chain of cause and effect can become a little bit opaque and confusing, and responsibility tends to get spread around. So that experience of individual agency can be a bit elusive in that setting. And speaking of Dwight, there's some great 
sociological literature on middle managers. And the picture that emerges is that they tend to feel quite insecure in their jobs. Now, if you're a, a carpenter, let's say, and you have a problem with your boss, you can say to him, it's plumb, it's level, and it's square. Go check it yourself. But when you don't have concrete standards like that to stand on, uh, you're never quite sure where you stand. And so you have to spend a lot of time kind of walking on eggshells and managing what others think of you. The office can be a fairly paranoid place as compared to the job site. And you could point to any number of other sort of pop culture items that are getting at something similar. Um, Dilbert, there's this fantastic movie, Office Space. It's a classic, really. <clears throat> so I think these give us some indication that a lot of people have uh, come to view their, their uh, sort of cubicle life with a kind of dark absurdism. So um, the question is, is there a more real alternative? Yeah, I mean, sh short of inseminating turkeys or something like that. And I think there is. So I want to speak up for the skilled manual trades and suggest that that can be a life that's worth choosing. Now, you might say, why does that even need to be said? Well, it does need to be said because I think we've developed something like an educational monoculture in this school, where just about every kid gets pressured to go to college and get on a certain track where you end up working in a cubicle. Um, now, hovering in the background of that fact, which is not repeated very often, is the fact that student loan debt has now surpassed a trillion dollars. Um, it's now greater than all credit card debt combined. And there's the further fact that males who start a four-year degree program, um, about two-thirds of them have not finished after six years. The numbers are a little bit better for women. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> as, as a lot of you know, high school shop class programs were pretty widely dismantled in the 90s to make room for computer classes, among other things. I think we had this idea then that we're somehow going to be gliding around in a pure information economy, you know, with everybody in front of their screens. But the truth is that some people, including some who are plenty smart, would rather be learning to build things and fix things. And why not honor that? Now, sometimes we do uh, praise people who do that kind of work. But um, the praise often has a kind of condescending edge to it. We might uh, praise them as the salt of the earth or emphasize the sacrifice for others that their work might entail. And of course, the, you know, that kind of sacrifice does occur. So think, for example, of the hazards faced by a lineman restoring power during a storm. But what if that kind of work answers as well to a basic human need of the one who does it. There's a very nice uh, poem by Marge Piercy, which ends with these lines. The pitcher longs for water to carry, and a person for work that is real. So <clears throat> I wonder if beneath our gratitude to the lineman is something else, um, something more like envy. Here's somebody doing something serious something that is possible to take seriously. And how many of us can say that? So <clears throat> the, the, the argument I want to make on behalf of the trades is it's kind of pieced together from a lot of different directions. And uh, just to kind of put it all in front of you at once, I'll say a little bit about the economic case, um, a little bit about the intrinsic satisfactions of this kind of work because, of course, a paycheck is not the only thing that we work for. Something about diversity of dispositions. By that, I just mean work that fits. Um, intellectual challenges. We don't often think of um, working with your hands as being intellectual in nature, but uh, it really is. And finally, I'll, I'll speculate a little bit about manual competence and how it might be related to moral education.
So the economic case, I'm going to I'm kind of gloss over fairly quickly. <clears throat> um, so there was a Princeton economist who pointed out maybe 10 years ago now that um, the distinction, the crucial distinction that is uh, has emerged in the labor market is not between those with more education versus those with less education. Rather, it's between those whose services can be delivered over a wire and those whose services has, have to be delivered on site or in person. And it's the latter who now find their livelihood more secure against outsourcing to distant countries. And we can update that thesis um, by saying also uh, work that is done on site or in person is more resistant to being colonized by artificial intelligence and automation. Just last week there was an article in The Economist making that point. <clears throat> So 30 years ago, we learned that anything that can be put in a box and then on a container ship is going to be made wherever labor is cheapest, and that's not here. In the last 15 years or so, a very similar logic has emerged for the products of intellectual labor that can be delivered um, over a wire. So for example, radiologists who examine images now find that they have to compete with radiologists in India who will work for much less and you know, have better English skills than we do. <clears throat> the same thing has happened to programmers and accountants. Um, I once dealt with the editor of an uh, American publication who turned out to be in the Philippines. But you can't fix a leaking toilet over the internet and therein lies a certain job security for the plumber. So if the goal is to earn a living, and obviously education has other goals besides that, but insofar as the goal is to earn a living, maybe it isn't really true that 18-year-olds need to be imparted with a sense of panic about getting into a four-year college. Though they certainly need to learn a lot post high school to earn a good living. So let me tell you just a little of my own <clears throat> story by way of background. I graduated from a big state school in California um, with a degree in physics. This is 1989. And I moved down to LA to look for work in the aerospace industry. And this is, uh, you know, the Cold War was winding down, aerospace was just laying people off. And so um, I sent out dozens of resumes and got essentially zero response. I was just about out of savings, and I found myself going around the parking lot of a home improvement store, putting flyers on the windshields of cars to advertise my services as an electrician, because that's work that I had done all through high school and college uh, during the summers. I started when I was 14 as a helper. So the flyer said, unlicensed but careful. <laughs> And it generated immediate response. <laughs> there was more demand for my services as an unlicensed electrician than as a college graduate. So I went into business for myself doing that illegally. <laughs> and um, I never stopped taking pleasure in this moment that would come at the end of the job when I would flip the switch and the light would come on. And um, so the effects of my work were visible, just literally visible to see. Um, and so my competence had a kind of social reality to it. It wasn't just a kind of private opinion I had of myself. I was sometimes made real quiet uh, by a site like this. So this is a hospital in Detroit. So here's a big gang of conduit that comes into a panel, and look in particular at the nestled flowing curves in the upper right-hand corner that come around and down and up and over. This was a skill that was so far beyond my abilities that I felt that I was in the presence of some genius, and that whoever bent this conduit probably imagined this moment of recognition 
as he worked, that at some point someone would come along and appreciate it for what it is. Uh, I think it's a, a work of art. And by the way, the name of the guy who bent this conduit is Denny Kay. And there he is with his pipe bender. So as a residential and light commercial electrician, most of my work got covered up inside of walls. But still, I felt pride in meeting the um, really aesthetic demands of a workmanlike installation. Because maybe another electrician would come along and open up the wall someday and see it, and I didn't want to be embarrassed at the thought of that sort of moment. But even if not, I felt responsible to my better self. Or better yet, to the thing itself. It's been said that craftsmanship consists simply in the desire to do something well for its own sake. So I think the main satisfaction is sort of private in that way. But there's nonetheless a sort of self-disclosing that takes place. There's a philosopher named Alexander Kojev who said that you recognize your own product in a world that has actually been transformed by your work. You recognize yourself in it. You discover and also reveal to others an objective reality that was at first only subjective in your head. The satisfactions of manifesting oneself concretely in the world through manual competence have been known to make a person quiet and easy. They seem to relieve him of the felt need to offer chattering interpretations of himself, to vindicate his worth, boasting. He can simply point. The building stands. The lights are on. The car now runs. He doesn't have much need for a sign like this one. Um, I think <laughs> the well-founded pride of the tradesperson is far from the gratuitous self-esteem that educators are sometimes told they have to impart to students as though by magic. And it's also far from the kind of anxiousness of Dwight. I mean, if you're an electrician, either you can bend conduit or you can't. And if you can't, the fact is plain for all to see. And what that means is that you have some solid ground to stand on in your own self-assessment. And it's the same ground on which others will assess you. And there's not a whole lot of interpretation involved. I think some people get hustled off to a four-year college and then to the cubicle against their own inclinations and natural bents, when they'd rather be learning to build things or fix things. There's a woodshop teacher named Doug Stowe, who's written very eloquently about his work as a shop teacher. He wrote that in schools, we create artificial learning environments for our children that they know to be contrived and undeserving of their full attention and engagement. Without the opportunity to learn through the hands, the world remains abstract and distant, and the passions for learning will not be engaged. Now, I don't think that's true of every student, but it's true of enough students that we ought to worry about it. A gifted young person, I'm talking about a smart kid, who chooses, let's say, to become a mechanic, rather than accumulate academic credentials, is viewed as eccentric, maybe even self-destructive. There's a pervasive anxiety among parents that there's only one track to success for their children, and it runs through a series of gates controlled by prestigious institutions. And of course, there's wide use of psychiatric drugs to medicate boys in particular against their natural bent toward action the better to uh, keep, keep things on track, as the school nurse says. <clears throat> I'm, I'm picturing Nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And this serves the interests of educators in preserving their own sanity. And I know that because I tried teaching high school for a year. And I would have loved to have had a Ritalin fogger in my classroom, <laughs> <laughs> just for the sake of maintaining order. Um, so I understand the problem, and I think what the problem is, is that it's a very rare person, male or female, 
who's naturally inclined to sit still for 16 years in school and then indefinitely at work. And yet this has become the one-size-fits-all norm, even as we go on about diversity in education. We don't do a good job of accommodating the diversity of dispositions and how people get excited about learning. Now, interestingly, as many of you know, things are very different in Germany and some of the other European countries where they have a very different culture surrounding work and education. So in Germany, a smart and ambitious 16-year-old uh, might imagine himself becoming, let's say, a prototype machinist at Mercedes-Benz. And that's a very uh, respectable aspiration to have. And in fact, it's about two-thirds of 16-year-olds there enter apprenticeship programs. In this country, apprenticeship is often criticized for being too narrow in education. It's often said that what the economy demands is workers who are flexible, uh, almost that, as though they shouldn't be burdened with any particular set of knowledge and skills, that sort of constantly, you know, willing to reinvent themselves. But it bears thinking about that when you go deep into some particular skill or art, it trains your powers of concentration and perception. You become more discerning about these particular objects, whatever they may be. And if all goes well, you get initiated into an ethic of caring about what you're doing. Usually that's by the example of some particular person, some mentor, who embodies that spirit of craftsmanship. So what I'm trying to say is that it, technical education, though it's certainly narrow in its immediate application, can be understood as part of education in the broadest sense, that is, intellectual and moral formation. I think the trades suffer from low prestige, and this is based in part on a simple mistake. Because the work is dirty, it's easy to assume that it's also stupid. We've developed a dichotomy of knowledge work versus manual work, as though these are two very different things. But that's a distinction that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. <clears throat> Say you're trying to diagnose why a car doesn't idle properly. It's not a trivial problem. And in general, I'd say that the kind of thinking that goes on in the trades can be genuinely impressive, but only if we stop to notice it. And conversely, I think we sometimes romanticize uh, some kinds of white-collar work by presuming that it has more intellectual content than it actually turns out to have. A lot of white-collar work gets dumbed down. Uh, there's such a thing as the electronic sweatshop that can be every bit as stultifying as the assembly line. But by contrast, what a plumber or an electrician or auto mechanic does is fundamentally different from the assembly line. It can never be reduced to simply following a set of procedures. The physical circumstances in which you do those jobs vary too much for the work to get fully routinized. It always requires improvisation and adaptability. And as a result, I think you feel like a human being, not a cog in a machine. Now, obviously, there's a great diversity of different kinds of work that take place in an office. And some of it is much, much better than others. <clears throat> now, I've had, I've had all kinds of jobs. And I've had some of the lousier white collar jobs. And I'm sure that colors my perception of these things. So I'm aware of that. But uh, I think the upshot is that the real question isn't do you work with your hands or work in an office? Rather, the question is whether the job entails using your own judgment or not. But it's on precisely those grounds that I think the trades are worth taking a fresh look at. They're not for everybody, but they can be a good life for someone who wants to use his or her mind at work. And I count myself in that category, so let me say a little bit about uh, the intellectual challenges of the work I do. <clears throat> so I have a, a small business <clears throat> repairing motorcycles in Richmond, Virginia. 
Um, it's actually, it's transitioned more to making parts for custom bikes. And I started this in 2002. I work on Japanese and European, occasionally British bikes. And these tend to be older bikes that have some vintage cachet that makes people willing to spend money on them, <clears throat> which is the whole point from my perspective. And um, so at one stage, the shop was in uh, this building. Um, <clears throat> It's also a bit of subliminal advertising for uh, my book. <laughs> Not very subtle, I guess. Um, so my decision to go into this line of work um, w seemed to perplex a lot of my acquaintances. The job I had immediately before this was at a think tank in Washington. So when I quit that job to go into business fixing bikes, it made for some awkward moments at cocktail parties. <clears throat> Because people ask, what do you do? And I'd say, I fix motorcycles. And often there'd be this sort of awkward silence, <laughs> you know, as, as though, oh, I'm sorry I asked. Um, but in saying that, I would be feeling pride, and the other person would be feeling sort of embarrassed on my behalf, so that there was just like this complete mismatch of perception. So let me see if I can explain the appeal. In fixing motorcycles, you come up with, you try to come up with some imagined train of cause and effect to account for whatever the symptoms are that are in front of you. And you try to judge how likely these different scenarios are before you go tearing down the bike. And this imagining relies on a kind of mental library that you develop. An internal combustion engine can work in any number of different ways. And different manufacturers have tried different approaches. And each of these has its own you know, particular ways of going bad and failing. <clears throat> so here's one that failed rather spectacularly. Um, what you're looking at is uh, basically a pile of shrapnel inside the crankcase of a Ducati bell drive motor. Um, there's the same motor put back together. So it was all OK in the end. Uh, so for example, um, you also develop a library of sounds and smells and feels. For example, the backfire that's caused by a, an air fuel mixture that's too lean is subtly different from a backfire that's caused by an ignition problem. And you begin to be able to tell the difference. As in any learned profession, you just have to know a lot. So if the bike is, let's say, 35 years old, like this, from an obscure maker that went out of business 30 years ago. This was a, a Spanish bike someone brought me. It's called a Mototrans. So its tendencies are known mostly through a kind of lore. I think it'd be impossible to do this kind of work in isolation without access to a collective historical memory. You have to be embedded in a community of what's really um, sort of mechanic antiquarians. And I find that these relationships are maintained by telephone, even in the internet age. It's a network of reciprocal favors that spans the country. My most reliable source is a guy named Fred Cousins in Chicago. And the only problem is that he has such an encyclopedic knowledge of obscure European motorcycles that all I can really offer him in exchange is the occasional delivery of obscure European beer. <laughs> Now, some diagnostic situations contain a lot of variables. And any given symptom may have several possible causes. And on top of that, these causes might interact with one another, which can make them very difficult to isolate. So in deciding how to go forward, there often comes a point where you just have to step back uh, and get, you know, have a cigarette, walk around the lift. There comes a point where the service manual is of no longer of any help whatsoever. <clears throat> There's a kind of gap between theory and practice that opens up all the time. And that's where it tends to get interesting. And what you need at such moments is the kind of judgment that arises only from experience. It's really hunches rather than rules. So for me, at least, there's more real thinking going on in the bike shop than there was at the think tank. Now, the think tank job sometimes required me to reason backwards from some desired conclusion to a suitable set of premises that would get you there. 
It was a policy place, and like all such places, it had taken certain positions, which meant that there were certain facts that we were more fond of, let's say, than other facts. And so I found myself making arguments that I didn't fully buy myself, and that was demoralizing. And on top of that, my boss seemed intent on training me according to a certain cognitive style, I'll call it. It was the, that of the world of corporate lobbying, which he had recently come from. So this style demanded that I project an image of rationality, that was very important, but not indulge too much in actual reasoning, because you know, it could sort of lead off in the wrong direction. So by contrast, in fixing bikes, either it starts and it runs right, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, there's no weaseling your way out of the fact. Uh, you answer to standards that aren't really open to manipulation or controversy. Um, you might say, I mean, the work is often frustrating, but it's never irrational. Uh, the BS quotient is, is very low, and I like that about it. Unless you're dealing with Harley owners, then that can actually be quite high. <laughs> People ask why I don't work on Harleys, and I say, I work on motorcycles, not lifestyles. I, you, you need a different kind of professional, the chaps and the do-rag. I, I don't quite get it. <laughs> so. Mechanical work requires you to develop certain intellectual habits. And habits of mind have an ethical dimension that we don't often think about. So good diagnosis of a machine requires attentiveness to it, almost a conversation with it, rather than assertiveness, as in the position papers written on K Street in Washington. The cognitive psychologists talk about metacognition, which is the activity of stepping back and thinking about your own thinking. It's what you do when you stop for a moment in your pursuit of a solution and wonder if your understanding of the problem is adequate. So for example, the slap of worn out pistons hitting their cylinders can sometimes sound quite a bit like loose valve tappets. So to be a good mechanic, you have to be constantly open to the possibility that you may be mistaken. And that's a virtue that is at once cognitive and moral. It seems to develop because the mechanic, now if he's the sort who goes on to become good at it, internalizes the, the sort of proper functioning of the motorcycle as an object of passionate concern. I don't know how else you can explain the elation that you feel uh, when you get to the root cause of some problem. It's those diagnostic moments that are really kind of the best moments in the shop. And this active concern for the motorcycle is reinforced by the social aspects of the job, what I'm calling social embeddedness. So like many independent mechanics, my business is based entirely on word of mouth. I sometimes barter services with machinists and metal fabricators. And that has a very different feel from transactions with money. It situates me in a community. And one result of, the, of that is that I really don't want to screw up somebody's bike or charge more than a fair price because people really do talk and your reputation is everything. Now you often hear people complain about mechanics and other people in the trades whom they take to be dishonest or incompetent. And I'm sure this is sometimes justified. But it's also true that the mechanic deals with a large element of chance. And that might be hard to appreciate if you've never uh, attempted that kind of work. So I once accidentally dropped a feeler gauge down through the cam chain tunnel on a, um, this is a Kawasaki Ninja. It was a brand new bike. It was doing its first scheduled valve adjustment. So this is a catastrophe. It meant I was going to have to tear down the motor uh, on, this, on this new bike. Now, I actually escaped having to do that through an operation that involved the use of a stethoscope and another pair of trusted hands. And the sort of concentration that we associate with a bomb squad, 
Um, it was a matter of, of using a magnet to draw it up, even though it was stainless steel, so not really, uh, just barely uh, magnetized. Now, when I finally laid my fingers on that feeler gauge, I felt like I had cheated death. And I don't remember ever feeling so alive as in the moments that followed. But often as not, that kind of uh, situation does not end so uh, nicely. Moments of elation are counterbalanced with failures. And these two are vivid. <clears throat> they take place right in front of your eyes. So one time, um, a uh, customer came back complaining of a shaking in the front end. And it turns out my shopmate had forgotten to tighten the nuts holding the axle on the front wheel of the bike. You know, nobody got hurt on that uh, occasion, but it, that's the kind of episode that tends to focus the mind. Um, so I think the trades in general are punctuated by moments of pleasure that take place against a darker backdrop, which is a keen awareness of catastrophe as this possibility that's always hovering just over your shoulder. The core experience, then, is one of individual responsibility. It tends to get cashed out in face-to-face -face interactions between a tradesperson and his or her customer. So I think um, a good job is, requires a field of action where you can put your best capacities to work and see a direct effect in the world. Educators who want to steer students toward work that has the kind of cognitive and social richness that I've tried to describe could do that in part by rehabilitating the skilled trades and uh, making students aware of them. Now, doing that would take courage. Any high school principal who doesn't claim as his or her goal 100% college attendance uh, is likely to be accused of harboring low expectations and uh, run out of town by indignant parents. And that indignation is hard to stand against because it carries all the moral weight of egalitarianism, right? Everyone should go to college. But on the other hand, it's also snobbish insofar as it regards the trades as a low expectation. So the thought I want to leave you with is that <clears throat> I think the best sort of democratic education would be neither snobbish nor egalitarian. Rather, it would give a place of honor in our common life to whatever is best. And at this weird moment of growing passivity and dependence, why don't we publicly recognize what's really a kind of democratic aristocracy among us? I mean those who gain real knowledge of real things, the kind that we all depend on every day. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, take questions or uh, rebuttals, additions, subtractions. And there's uh, some microphones being handed around, so just raise your hand. Considering what a well-rounded person Leonardo da Vinci was, how many of him could we stand in today's world? How many can we stand? Yes. <laughs> I think the, another question was how, how likely are we to, to, to produce such individuals? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the sort of, you have these figures of genius who appear at moments in history. I think the very idea of genius is sort of, uh, suffers from a bad conscience these days, right? It's, uh, we don't like the idea that there are human beings who are so far above the rest of us <laughs> that, uh, you know, they stand out in that way. But, um, but I think, you know, a, a guy like Leonardo is interesting because um, well, as, just as you said, a Renaissance man who was comfortable in sort of every different art and discipline. Um, yeah, specialization has really gotten to a point that um, it's hard to, hard to conceive of such figures uh, arising among us. But they, they, they remain inspiring. That's, that's all I've got. <laughs>
Um, I wanted to ask, what's your take on convincing young females that the trades is something that's a good opportunity for them as well? It seems embedded in our culture for so many years that this is just for young men, and that's changing a little bit now, but what, what would your take be on that? Well, I guess the bottom line would be that the appeal of doing concrete work you know, that has a straightforward utility for other people in the world is, I think, equally appealing to men and women. Um, a lot of the trades I've talked about are, I've picked because I have some personal familiarity with them, so, and, and they tend to be male-dominated. There's other things like nursing that tend to be quite, um, you know, more dominated by women, physical therapy, things like that. And I think everything I've said today would apply to those as well. Now, it's also the case that more women have been going into the traditionally male trades. In some ways, I think, you know, they, they make better students just because they're not quite as distracted by all, the, uh, all those male energies that, especially at you know, age 18, are pretty hard to tame. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a shifting landscape in terms of the, the gender makeup of these different trades. But I think there's really no reason, uh, in principle, that... Um, I mean, I guess you have to have a tough skin, right? I mean, there's still going to be, you know, catcalling and, you know, lewd remarks probably on a, on, a, on a construction site, for example. So, and that, you know, having a thick skin is really not something that's being much encouraged uh, for young women in, in four-year university, right? It's all about the sort of fragility and, um, you know, kind of melodrama of, of victimhood. So I think that mentality would not play on a construction site, obviously. Yeah. It's hard to see, but um, if there's no question for the moment, I want to, um, I was speaking just before getting up here uh, with a woman, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget your name, who's a provost of, um, institutions like this, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we were talking in particular about kind of the, the place of these kind of arguments in uh, the history of African American thinking about work and education. And what I mentioned to her um, was this old debate you may be familiar with between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois where Booker T was more emphasizing <clears throat> technical skills, uh, entrepreneurship, and Du Bois, you know, his famous line is the talented tenth. He was a Harvard, you know, classically educated guy, and he was all about um, the talented tenth. It was a frankly elitist argument. And I think it's time to revisit that uh, debate, not simply in the context of um, sort of the life prospects for African Americans, but for all students, really, that an emphasis simply on, um, you know, trying to pass through these gates to get into the most prestigious institutions is, um, that's like a winner-take-all kind of economic model. And the vast majority of us don't, uh, don't make it into those top-tier sort of locations in the economy. So I think um, there's some real intellectual resources to be had by revisiting Booker, Booker T. Washington's argument on behalf of um, training in the skills. And that's uh, something I'd like to see kind of revived. I do have a comment. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I do have a comment, and I just want to um, congratulate you and thank Thank you to who, thank you and whoever brought you here because I think for our future, because in the 90s there was a divide, a distance of the trade and more, um, everybody has to go to college or bust. And so um, what, what I see happening, I'm a resident of Newport News, the vice, vice mayor of our great city, but what I see happening in our communities and where we're having trouble and having to spend additional resources is because the people who are not made for college, they're simply going to drop out because we haven't equipped the school system or we haven't equipped human services or our businesses. 
to accommodate them, so they end up becoming the people who are just roaming, in, roaming around in the community and then start getting into trouble with our legal system because they're trying to make a living on their own, probably because of what you said, they want to do things with their hands or do something different, and it ends up the wrong thing with the hands instead of us training them for the right things with their hands. So I think when we realize the beautiful marriage, this could be if we couple education with what to do with the hands and increasing our trade. You know, I'm a product of, of Virginia Commonwealth University, but if I had my life to do over again, I, my second career was a three-week course in passing a $67 test in real, real estate, and I made the most money off of the three-week course. And so, and so if I could do my life again, I would do real estate and construction because I don't have to wait for anybody to hire me. I can get out here and do business myself. So I really hope we continue this conversation and realize the importance of what you're saying uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And you, you touched on something that Senator Kane also mentioned, which is that ca career technical education seems to be a more reliable kind of impetus to entrepreneurship then, I mean, think about it. trying to, you know, get into Harvard or something, your, your whole life becomes oriented to sort of pleasing institutions, right? Um, it's a kind of tr training in, <laughs> I'm trying to be polite here. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, being an organization kid, right? It's a sort of lack of independence spirit. And I think the spirit of independence is really kind of on the wane. You know, people are kind of rule followers, and you don't get you don't get a healthy economy or innovation from everybody, you know, doing what they feel like they're supposed to do. Um, there was something else you said that prompted a thought that's now escaped my porous head, but it, it'll come back if there's some other question. Coming and speaking, it was really good. And um, I think this question kind of may encapsulate what uh, some question, other questions in, in the whole, your whole presentation. So, what do you think? I think many of us in here recognize the value now. Obviously, most people, if not all, recognize the value of skills in this <coughs> paradigm shift. Yeah, I think, and I guess my question is this What do you see as the mechanism to facilitate? this, for lack of better terms, intellectual paradigm shift that we need across the states to get rid of this stigma that is levied on the people that have the, the hands-on skills and the hard, you know, the actual laborers. Yeah. yeah, good question. So in other words, what, what is the PR approach for kind of making this case? You know, this being America, um, I think the economic argument is the one that, that tends to carry the most sort of immediate weight with parents. So the parents are really, you know, your audience, I think, ultimately. Um, I've tried to speak about the intrinsic satisfactions and all that, and that's all well and good, but if you can show parents that there's real opportunity uh, in some of these trades. Now, you have to be smart. I would never encourage a kid to go into you know, drywall or roofing. You can't make a good living, or framing. Um, in part, it's the trades that require a license to practice, or sort of certifications. There's a barrier to entry that keeps wages high. Um, so, um, so there's the economic case, and I think that case is going to become more easily recognized by parents as the higher education bubble, let's call it, uh, seems poised to, to burst. I'm talking about the student loan debt. I'm talking about the, the very uncertain prospects of getting a good job with your four-year degree. Um, so that case is starting to make itself. The other case, um, I think is to disentangle, or rather sort of call bogus, uh, this distinction between um, knowledge work and manual work, and point out the cognitive demands and cognitive richness of some of the skilled trades. 
And that's not, I mean, so that speaks to the issue of respectability, right? The work might be dirty, but in fact, no, it's not stupid. But th this also gets to a very important issue that's looming now, which is artificial intelligence and automation. Now, um, the jobs that are, you know, going to be most subject to getting dislocated by all that are, again, jobs that uh, require, you know, moving symbols around, whether it's a radiologist, you know, pattern recognition has gotten very good. That's what a radiologist does. They recognize patterns. Translation, um, all, the, all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> anytime things have to be manipulated in the physical world, robots are way, way behind. I mean, these hands are the product of millions of years of evolution. There's a lot of engineering in them. And again, this article I mentioned last week in The Economist was making this case. So there's a lot of hype around robotics and, um, and certainly in things like mass manufacturing, you've already had, <clears throat> you know, robotics can, you know, can assemble, you know, do a lot of the assembly work on cars and such, but the skilled trades that are done on site, you're not going to see robots uh, building houses. That's just not going to happen. So, <clears throat> uh, so in other words, the economic case and the, the cognitive sort of richness of the work are, are intertwined because if, if something can be dumbed down, it will be dumbed down and then uh, it will be replaced by machines. So all these things are mixed up. Yes? In terms of credentials and certifications, I mean, how many colleges try to elevate, and the legislature try to elevate the importance of those things uh, to the community and create a pathway for students? Uh, employers don't always respect or value those, those kind of things, and they, they often perceive that as proof learning. Mm. And uh, the difficulty in, in getting the employers to buy into that challenge that we faced at, at community college in, in uh, Central Virginia, but can you maybe speak to the importance or how we change that mindset? Well, um, I don't know nearly as much about this as, as you do, clearly, but I, I mean, I gather that the crucial thing is to have uh, employers involved in crafting the standards by which someone gets a certification so that it's meaningful and it's not simply book learning. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the idea that this is merely book learning, if in fact that's what it is. It seems to me on-the-job sort of apprenticeship programs are really crucial, um, you know, f for both the employer and the, uh, and the student. And again, I bring up Germany where there's a, just such a stronger partnership between firms and the education system. And, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, President Dever was talking about just uh, moments ago about the acute shortage of skilled labor in so many fields. And it, it does seem like um, corporations um, are going to have to completely rethink their commitment to education because, uh, is getting to the sort of crisis point in their inability to find workers. It's hard to imagine, you know, exactly what that's going to look like, maybe a, a German model, but I think the state has to kind of get involved in the sort of matchmaking between firms and um, students. And so I think it's a good time to look abroad for different models of how that's been accomplished. And it would entail a cultural shift. Um, one of the sort of articles of faith in our free market fundamentalism that we have here is that any kind of licensing requirement is bad because that's a barrier to entry and we want sort of the f free movement of, you know, capital and labor. <clears throat> but the, the one nice thing about a licensing requirement is that it means a student can see a trajectory for themselves. If I, I stick with this all the way to the point where I get licensed, then I know I have a real living wage because it's secured by that barrier to entry. 
And that means in turn that during the apprenticeship years, he or she is willing to accept a lower wage knowing that there's going to be a payoff at the end. Being willing to accept that lower wage in the training phase makes them more attractive to firms to hire them as apprentices. So I think the issue of um, licensing might also be revisited profitably. Okay. So, so um, I really appreciate your comments on the challenges of every problem. Repairing an engine could be different, and you really have to think it out, and it's, it's a very difficult and then rewarding when you solve activity. Um, but, and I, I'm going to put that, I talk about STEM, different elements of STEM to folks, I'm going to steal that from you. Um, the thing that bothered me, the thing that bothered me is that I heard some stereotyping. The universities, for example, are all one way. And they're not. You know, we have lots of examples of people who have left the university and created their own through innovation and entrepreneurship, their own uh, capabilities that have changed the nation, changed the world. Um, what I have seen over time is really it's folks working together. It's the technicians with the hand skills or now the computer skills sometimes and engineers and scientists all working together to solve really difficult problems. An example would be going beyond the engine that exploded or the shrapnel in the uh, crankcase would be why did it break apart? What happened to cause it? And that may require a technician or even someone who's been through an apprentice program to team up with an engineer or a metallurgist and look at what was there and then together they can innovate a solution that might be last longer, it might be cheaper, it might be lighter. And it's this ability to work across from trades through apprentice to engineering to science and math maybe even that really allows us the true innovation and this is communication and ability to see each, see one another is very important to the total picture of problem solving and innovation. Would you comment on that please? Yeah, no I think that's that's an important point that um, you have to have uh, technicians and engineers who can speak one another's language. And part of the, the difficulty is that um, it's no longer the case that the engineer started as a, te as a technician or necessarily grew up working on the farm or working on cars. So there's um, you know, the, the person who's in a managerial position in an engineering firm may have come through a career route where he never actually had that hands-on uh, experience. And likewise, the technician, there may be very little opportunity to sort of rise up the ranks within a single organization and learn it from the ground up so that decision makers have that deep knowledge of the, you know, soup to nuts of the whole organization. So that's... Um, and so you, you lose vast amounts of, um, of sort of knowledge embedded in an organization by not having those kind of trajectories within it. Um, so that, I think that's one of the, the big challenges in the lack of uh, collaborative communication between people at different levels in a group, in, in, a, in a firm. Um, so once again, that's a kind of big systemic um, thing to be addressed. But you're right, in, in order to really solve problems, you have to have different levels of kind of abstraction and uh, involvement with the thing, you know, at different, because it appears differently, it, you know, viewed from different angles, the old, you know, elephant and the blind men metaphor. Um, so thank you. And um, thanks to everyone for, for listening, coming out. So, so long.